I love those aerial shots. Did you hang out of a helicopter to get those? That was amazing. Wow. And by the way, Pastor Sean, thank you for reminding me how old I am. You're welcome. You were two years old when we started the church. That's great. Gosh, it makes you feel so old. 20 years ago. Let me take you back for a moment, because some of you may be wondering, like, how did this church get started? Because you look around, this place is massive, the place is packed, God has been good, but it started from a very small beginning. It began way back in 1998 when my wife and I, and we had a bouncing baby girl and a boy on the way, and a very hyperactive black lab and an overdrugged cat climbed into a U-Haul truck and made our way to Michigan. Some of you probably just, only thing you just heard now was overdrugged cat. <laughs> I assure you, the cat would have slayed us on the drive, so we had to drug it up. It was kind of funny to see, but anyway, that's a whole different story. We made our way to Grand Rapids with the intention of starting a church. And when we started, it was so feeble, so small. We would knock on doors. We hosted these little parties. We played volleyball. We did cookouts. We did all these things. And then we partnered with different Wesleyan churches that were in the local area. And finally, 12 brave families came on board to start the mission of Frontline. And we began in a factory bay at McDonald's Industrial Products. We hung these curtains and, and blocked off all the machinery and then made ourselves a little sanctuary in the middle of the industrial heart of a factory bay. And we did preview services there in 1999. And then we relocated to Pine Island Elementary School, where our numbers of 35 in the factory bay swelled to 72 in the school for our grand opening. So it was a small beginning, you can see. And I, I swear, we counted everybody. We counted the janitor and some mice to get those numbers up, you understand? <laughs> Because mice need Jesus too. So we did everything we could, right? And then we kind of slumped down in our attendance and then gradually we built it up and it grew. We got to about 100 and that's when we needed to hire a staff person, Brian. That's when we brought him on, right at that time, yeah. Or as I actually call him, Bri or the Briolator. <laughs> you missed that, yeah. I'll, I'll text you every day about that. So we brought him on board, and then we issued the challenge because we relocated to yet another place called First Wesleyan that was on Three Mile, a little five-acre plot over there. And we issued the challenge to the board that, okay, or the congregation, that there's no way you can get over 300. We're averaging 120 at the time, whatever. There's no way you can get 300 there. But if you hit that goal, you are allowed to shave us bald. We thought there is no way. And of course, that Sunday, we welcomed 324 people in attendance. And after the church service, the board proceeded to come up on stage and shave us bald like basic trainees. It was weird. I mean, it, what was wild about that is the visitors would come and they, it's like, are you guys from a monastery or something? You're like some monks or, it was crazy. But from there, we just continued to grow. We added new staff members. We increased our ministry capabilities and the church just grew like a hundred a year. It was just amazing to see God's blessing on the church, even in spite of our weaknesses and flaws. And my wife will tell you, I have a lot of them, but we are blessed that God blessed in spite of that. So then we had challenges because we were running three services at the time and it was just breaking our backs because the load was so much. We had people walking from different parking lots down the road. If we had Fitbits back then, they would have had a lot of steps in. So we were working hard, right? And then God opened up the opportunity to relocate to a Meyer office building, which is where you're seated today. I bet the people in cubicles that were working in this room had no idea that someday this building would be changed and transformed into a kingdom building ministry. Is that not amazing? So yeah, God has done some amazing things. And then to bring that full circle now, Meyer trucks are coming here to drop off supplies for the needy. Isn't that beautiful? See, that's what God does. I love what he does. He's about that. And then our opening service here, we had over a thousand and God, we just haven't looked back from there. So why did we do that? That would be the ultimate question. Do we just need another church on the map or do we want to start another social do-gooders institution to do good for the community? Certainly not. Because it's much deeper. Well, we want to do good things for the community. But I'm saying beyond that, it's a much deeper 
reason. Renee and I left to come here to start a church because of conviction. The conviction was based on the fact that we felt called to start a new work of God, even though we had no idea what to do. We had no knowledge, no experience, but lots of passion. We're basically excited idiots. But we, we, we believe we were called. So we're called, we're going to do this, right? But secondly, was the message of Scripture, the belief the conviction that God wants to perpetuate his message of salvation through his son, through the entity called the church. And that's what we're going to look at in a passage today to substantiate what I'm talking about. In fact, we developed a mission statement that drove all of that. Reaching, connecting, sending. Three progressive, successive words that have power and pop to them. We want to reach people with the message of Christ, connect them to the person of Christ, and then send them out in the world equipped to serve people for Christ. That was the whole mission. And it's based on several passages, but one I'd like you to take a look at with me today comes from Matthew chapter 16. We're going to spray it up on the screens, but if you have your phones and like to follow along, or your actual Bible if you're old school, which is great. So please follow along. So Matthew 16 says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples a very powerful question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Up until this point in Jesus' ministry, they were still a little unclear about who he was. He had healed a lot of people, he taught profound truths, and he had performed all these eye-popping, spectacular, mesmerizing, heart-rending, nature-altering miracles that flabbergasted his disciples. They thought, who is this guy? But they were still sketchy on the finer details of Jesus' identity. And so at this point, he checks their knowledge. He checks them and says, who do people say that I am? And he takes that broad and general question and he narrows it specifically to the people, to these disciples, who do you say that I am? Ladies and gentlemen, there is not a person in this room who will not answer that question. Every human being who will ever be born must answer the identity question. Who is Jesus? That's a pretty profound statement. So we have to embrace that. Why? Because that determines our eternal destiny. That's the conviction. So it goes on to say, Simon Peter, blessed are you. You are the, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up for a second. He says, but... What about you? And, they, and Peter steps forward and he answers with boldness and clarity, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Correct answer. In fact, Peter was ready for, with a savory compliment. Notice what he says here. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. That shows the partnership between the church and the Holy Spirit working together to bring us into clarity and focus of who Jesus really is. And then he says, and then I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, that's a weird phrase, isn't it? The gates of hell or Hades, in this case is death, will not prevail against it. Does that seem awkward to you? When you translate this passage, you think of gates as a defensive measure, not an offensive measure. You've never seen an F-22 Raptor air fighter jet with a set of gates attached to the front of it. You've never seen an Abrams A1 hull with a set of gates attached to it. You'll never hear an enemy issue an ultimatum that says, if you don't surrender, we will gate you. Right? That doesn't make any sense, right? Because gates are a defensive measure, which shows then that they will not prevail against the church's advance or movement forward. Because ladies and gentlemen, the church is on the move. Let me show you another verse where that's true. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 says, And from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has, here it is, been forcefully advancing, and violent people are attacking it. This brings us to what I call the frontline principle. The frontline principle simply states that we are waging a spiritual war. I've said many times when preaching here before, I wish we could somehow rip open the veil between time and eternity and you could look beyond your senses and see what's happening. Every person sitting in this auditorium 
There is a war battling over your will, over your decision, your choice in this life of who Jesus really is. Everyone has to answer, who do you say I am? And that's what that's about. So we have to recognize there is a spiritual war being waged for every one of you, which is why prayer is so critical. Lastly, I want to issue the challenge. This is what the frontline principle does. It issues the challenge to each of us. Choose to be active on the front line rather than inactive on the sideline. Now, what does that mean? It means you take what's been given to you, God's grace, his love, and his mercy, and you simply pass it on to others. The Great Commission was not meant to be a close hold thing. We're to show and tell it, to get it out to our community, our respective front lines into our world. Because that's how God's kingdom advances. This is why we gave Frontline the name Frontline. Frontline is far more than a name. It's a movement. It's a movement that ripples outward and onward through communities and generations. And it cannot do so without us. We must participate. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are affiliated with this church. If this church is home, you are affiliated with one of the many thousands of churches or spiritual outposts on the front line of the spiritual war that is waging around us. And you play an integral part of getting the identity question solved for others so that they would know Jesus as well. And by the way, this war will be waged with or without our cooperation. But since souls matter so much to God, shouldn't they matter to us? He cares for those cantankerous, prideful, sin-soaked beings you go to work with or do life with at home, right? He knows. He loves them. And he's mobilizing you to go be a part of their lives and bring the kingdom to them so they can come to Jesus. That's what it's about. So ladies and gentlemen, Frontline started with a very fragile past, like a little seedling being planted into the ground. But God, in his mercy and grace, grew it into a powerful entity that it is today. It's a rugged story. It's a story of loss and hardship and difficulty, as many great works of God are. But isn't that a trophy of grace? That's what you and I are. We're trophies of grace. We have scars and mars and wounds and brokenness. That's what grace is about. And the church is no different because you are the church. You will boldly move forward into the future because today you are healthy, you're strong, you're robust, you're vibrant, and you're courageous. And it makes me wonder, since you are a movement, what's next for Frontline? Thank you, Jim. Two things I want to do here. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. If you, and we had many in the first service, so I'm not sure how many will be here for a second service. If you were a part of that original launch team with Jim and Renee in 2000 to help launch the church, or if you came any time in that first year, in the year 2000, would you just stand up uh, right now in this place? We want to honor you. If you're here, yes, several of you are here. Okay, awesome. That's good. Just say, give them a hand. Man. Yeah. I just want to say, yeah, you guys can take a seat. I just want to say to each of you, thank you for allowing yourselves to step out and take a kingdom risk. And especially Jim and Renee, thank you guys for being willing to move here, to be willing to say yes, even before you understood the how of how it was all going to work out. And the Holy Spirit has moved powerfully through you and our lives have been impacted because of the risk that you took. And so we're grateful for you. And so I want to say thank you. The second thing I want to say is I actually believe that our best days as a church are actually ahead of us. It's incredible to be able to look back. It's incredible to be able to thank God for 20 years. But we don't believe our best days are behind us. We actually believe that our best days as a church are ahead of us. But in order for that to happen, there's a shift that we need to make as a church. And actually, it's the exact same shift that you see Jesus make in Mark chapter 3 with his disciples. If you're just joining us, you may not realize that oh, since the beginning of January, we've been working our way through a teaching series called Jesus Unfiltered. And what we're doing is we're just following Jesus through the gospel of Mark. 
So every week, literally, we're just looking at the next chunk of the story of Mark. And it just so happens that Mark chapter 3 is the, the passage of Scripture. We didn't actually plan this, but it's the passage of Scripture we're looking at today. And so what's been happening so far is in Mark uh, is that Jesus' name is becoming more and more famous and people are coming and they're beginning to understand who Jesus is. They're beginning to answer that question that Jim was just talking about a moment ago. But what's happened is Jesus' ministry is basically in this area right around the Sea of Galilee. There are these little towns around the Sea of Galilee in this little local area and that's where he's known. But this is the moment in Mark chapter three where the top gets blown off of it. This is Mark three starting in verse seven. It says, Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, from east of the Jordan River, and even from as far north as Tyre and Sidon. Okay, so the ministry has now become regional. It's not just around this local area. Now people are coming from everywhere. And as a result, it says, the news about his miracles had spread far and wide and vast numbers of people came to see him. So Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so the crowd would not crush him. I mean, get that image in your mind. Jesus is literally so overwhelmed by the crowd of people, the human Jesus, that, that are crushing him. And we know that Jesus can meet any need that we have, right? But humanly, in this moment, he has to have like an escape boat ready because the crowd and the needs are so great. And so here's where the shift in his ministry happens. And this shift impacts the entire rest of the gospel of Mark. The entire ministry changes from this point on. It's right here in verse 13. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. It's the first time you see that word in the gospel story. They were to accompany him and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. So the shift that Jesus makes is he doesn't just continue to keep trying to meet all the needs himself, just spinning faster and faster and faster, trying to meet more and more needs as more and more people come. What he does is out of this huge crowd of disciples, he selects 12 of them and he appoints them to be apostles. Now the words matter here. The word in the original language for disciple means a learner. It's, it's someone who follows. It's someone who is a learner. They're learning about how to follow Jesus. The word apostle is the word apostello, and it means one who is sent out. That's what the word means. And so just to kind of put it simply, a disciple is one who follows. An apostle is one who is sent out, and they're sent out with authority to do so they're not just disciples that are following more. They're actually being sent out to do the things that they saw Jesus doing up to this point. In the corresponding chapter in Matthew's gospel, Matthew tells the same story, but he includes some extra details. This is what Matthew says in uh, chapter nine. He says, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to what? To send out. There's that concept again. To send out workers into his harvest field. So, so for Jesus, the way he identifies the problem is, look, the, the problem is not that, you know, there's a problem out there keeping people from coming to me. The harvest is plentiful. There's no problem with people wanting to come the problem is actually in here. The workers are few. We need more people being sent. We need more people serving. We need more people being willing to sacrifice and lay down their lives and take a kingdom risk like that first group of people did to help start this church. And so for Jesus, the shift is how do we turn disciples into apostles? How do we turn disciples into apostles? The more disciples you have, the more apostles you need, the more people you need being sent out on mission to be agents of the kingdom of God. The biggest obstacles for the kingdom advancing at Frontline Church are not out there. They're actually in here. Will we be willing to be sent? Will some of us be willing to become apostles and to see our lives as being sent as agents for the kingdom of God? That's very different than a lot of the rhetoric you hear today when people talk about the church. 
I don't know if you've noticed it, but something that's changed a lot in 20 years, when people talk about the church today, people will say things like, you know, people just don't go to church the way they used to. People just don't believe in Jesus like they used to. Our culture is becoming more and more hostile to the name of Jesus, to the church. You can't talk about your faith out like you used to. And so what happens is well, it's, we start taking on a defensive posture. And in, in a lot of churches, what's happening is churches have, are becoming like a safe harbor. Like we're just gonna be kind of a safe harbor for the faithful to come and huddle. And we'll just kind of protect ourselves against the storm of our culture outside. And it's true, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what a ship was made for. And as you just heard Jim share, that's not what this church was made for. That's not what this church was founded on. This church is supposed to be an agent of moving out into our culture, into our world, boldly with the message of Jesus. So, so we need to make the same shift that Jesus was making. Instead of changing the church to be a safe harbor, Jesus wants to change us, his church, to be sent out, apostello, to be sent out as agents of the kingdom of God, to be men and women who are on mission. The question is, will we do it? Will we have the guts to do that in our next season as a church? Something that uh, Jim used to say all the time, I love that you just ended your message uh, saying that just a second ago, but I remember when I first came on staff, Jim and I would have staff meetings and we would, literally our staff meetings were like me and Jim sitting in a room just going like, what do you wanna do this week? I don't know. Uh, neither one of us had really done this before. And so um, something that I remember you saying again and again in our staff meetings is you would say, you know, I just feel like Frontline, like the name Frontline is supposed to be a movement someday. Like it's not just supposed to be the, a local church. That's it. It's, Frontline is supposed to be a movement someday. And then we both kind of shrug at each other. Jim didn't know what that meant. I didn't really know what that meant, but it stuck with me all these years. And Jim, you had no idea the way the Holy Spirit was prophetically speaking through you in that moment because we are in that moment right now. Uh, if you're, you may not be aware other than just what the video talked about, but we are part of something now called the Zero Collective. And the Zero Collective is just taking our vision that these five zeros of what it looks like when the mission is happening of reaching, connecting, sending. And we've created this network of churches. We felt like God led us to do that. And we are now three churches in this Zero Collective network. Frontline Church is the culture carrier. This is the church that has the DNA that the other churches are, are um, taking part in. The Center Church in Byron Center and New Life Church in Wayland, both on the south end of town. And those churches have become a part of us and are thriving and are growing. And God has opened up these doors for this to happen. And what's happening is we have more churches right now asking us to be a part of it. They, they, there are other churches in our area, in our community saying, we want in on this. How do we get in on this Zero Collective Network? But it requires some sacrifice. This past June, uh, Brad Vanderson, who many of you know Brad, if you've been a part of Frontline, he was our student ministries pastor for a number of years. Brad went to become the lead pastor of New Life Church when they became a part of us and became a part of the Zero Collective. And New Life just had over 300 people at Christmas time. It's the first time they've ever had that many people. And God is moving and changing lives. They had 16 baptisms at their last baptism service. They're doing a baptism service this morning as well. God is on the move. But what they needed is they needed a worship component. They didn't have um, a worship leader. And so uh, just in this last month, Matt and Meg Pearson have gone to be their worship leaders at uh, New Life Church. And if you, yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> Matt and Meg, if you recognize them, they've been on our stage for a couple of years now. And so Corey sent them to be a part of it. By the way, Corey told me, that um, between the band and the tech, just serving this morning, they counted up collectively how many years all of them had been at Frontline. 152 years was the number between the band and tech just serving this morning um, for these services. So, so there are people that have come, they've been disciples, they've been followers, God has been breathing into them, and now they're being sent out. The greatest obstacles to the kingdom of advancing are not out there. The harvest is plentiful. Churches are begging us to be a part of us. The biggest obstacles are in here. Will we do it? Will we be sent? Will, be, will we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us to be sent? Will we do that? That's the critical question. That's the critical shift that has to happen. Will we join him in that? I'll, I'll close with this story. God is always at work in our midst and sometimes in ways that just absolutely blow our minds. 
uh, a month ago at our Christmas services. We did three identical Christmas services, and we just challenged all of you to just invite friends, uh, be in people's lives, be agents of the kingdom. And so I, if you were here, you remember this, but if you weren't here, we put a giant door in the middle of the room. I think we've got a picture of it up here. Yeah, there, we put this giant door in the middle of the room. And what we did for our Christmas services is we looked at the passage in John 10 where Jesus says, I am the door. And if anyone walks through me, he will be saved. Talking about his relationship to us. And so what we did in that room is we invited people to make a public decision to follow Jesus by coming from wherever they were in the room and walking through that door to signify that they were surrendering their lives to Christ. And we have many people who did that. There was one woman who came to the eight o'clock service uh, on um, the first night. And she came, she was invited by her family who go here to Frontline. She was in from out of town and she doesn't go to church. She never made a public decision for Jesus. And so they invite her, come with us to the Christmas service. Now what their, her family knew is that several months before this, uh, she had had emergency open heart surgery. So literally to save her life, she had undergone very, you know, in an emergency fashion, this open heart surgery in order to save her life. What her family did not know, and that she had told no one, is that when they put her under the anesthesia for that surgery, she had a dream about a door. And she wakes up from this surgery and she remembers this dream about the door and she keeps thinking about this, this dream and this door she has. And so when she walks in those doors right there at the back of the room for the eight o'clock service with her family and she sees the door set up in the middle of the room, she says to her family, I'm supposed to walk through that door. And she doesn't even know what we're doing. She doesn't even know what the whole point of the door is or what the service is. But when we got to that point in the service where we were inviting people. Jesus is the door. He said, enter through me and you'll be saved. And we were inviting people to walk through the door of Jesus. Nobody had to tell her what to do in that moment. She got out of her chair and she went for it because Jesus had already been working in her life. He'd already been speaking in her life. He'd already been pursuing her. And that's the point. The biggest obstacles we have are not out there. Jesus is speaking to people. He is calling people because he loves them, because he desperately wants to be in relationship with him. The Father is calling people to come to him. They're, he, they're having dreams. They're waking up and they're wondering what the purpose of their life is for. They're, they're going through hard times and they're wondering if this is all there is, if there is anything that's a real hope. The greatest obstacles are not out there. The greatest obstacles are in here. Will we join him? Will we say yes, even before we know the how, even before all our questions get answered? Will we say yes, you can send me? So, so the question this morning is where is the Holy Spirit sending you? Some of you, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you and he is going to send you out as an apostle, as an agent of the kingdom of God in the marketplace where you work going to be a light for the kingdom of God there. Others of you in this place, I believe God is going to begin to speak to you and he's going to send you out as an apostle into the nonprofit world, much like Jessica and Nora and some of the others who started the storehouse on this side of our building. Others of you in this room, the Holy Spirit, I believe is going to begin to speak to you, to raise you up and to send you out as an apostle for the kingdom of God with the church, with the Zero Collective, as more and more churches come on board on this. And it's gonna be a sacrifice. It's gonna be messy. There are gonna be moments where we're asking, how in the world are we gonna do this? But it's our job is to say yes, because he is at work. There's nothing stopping the church, nothing that can stop the church when we say yes to the kingdom. I can't think of anything better to do today than to celebrate baptism. And so um, we're gonna move into baptism now in a, in a second. Um, we're gonna stand and sing a song and, we, and then we're gonna have the first of our baptisms is gonna be a special baptism. And then after that, we're gonna open it up to anybody else who wants to, but I'd love if you could just bow and pray with me quickly before we start that. Lord Jesus, this is your church. And it always has been, and it always will be. And so our posture this morning is, 
Thank you for the cross. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for paying the price for our sins. Thank you for raising from, from the grave to give us new life. And then literally letting us get to be a part of your kingdom work on this planet. We get to do this. We get to be your church. Thank you for who you are. Would you send us out, God? I pray even right now in this room that you would begin to touch people and anoint them by your Holy Spirit to be sent out as agents of the kingdom of God. Would you continue to bring more and more and more and more disciples and as more and more disciples, God, would you raise up more and more apostles for your kingdom? We'll look to you because yours is the name above every name. Yours is the one that deserves all the glory. It's your power that changes the life. It's your power that redeems the lost. It's your power that we celebrate in baptism. We just worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Would you stand with us?